Welcome to Museum Moments. I'm your host, Rob Lauer. New art exhibits, courtyard concerts, kites, and summer camps for kids of all ages. Those are some of the museum-sponsored events taking place this May and June here in Museum City, Portsmouth. And we'll tell you all about them on this episode of Museum Moments. <music> Welcome to our May-June 2016 episode of Museum Moments. The Virginia Sports Hall of Fame, located on High Street in Old Town, is one of the region's premier attractions. And now through June, it's hosting a special display created especially for it. Here's the Hall of Fame's curator, Diane Blanchard Gross, to tell us about it. Well, Diana, thanks for joining us today. My pleasure. So there are some things going here on here at the uh, Sports Hall of Fame. Yes, yeah, so we are excited. Um, in our changing um, gallery here at the Virginia Sports Hall of Fame, we have a wonderful exhibition. It's called Love of the Game. It's works by Clayton Singleton. And Clayton Singleton is a phenomenal artist. He uh, lives and works in Norfolk. He actually teaches at um, Lake Taylor High School, teaches yeah. art there. And um, I'm a big fan of his and I asked him to uh, and I saw some of his work one time at a, at a local art festival and it had some sports imagery in it mm -hmm. and I was like oh that is so gorgeous it is so beautiful and I said would you make more work that dealt with sports and he said I would be pleased and proud to so these are wonderful paintings and mixed media pieces that he created specifically for the Sports Hall of Fame and oh, obviously wow. the exhibition all the exhibitions in our changing gallery have to do with sports right that is the caveat so mm -hmm. he has created some wonderful pieces that deal with um, baseball and football and swimming and gymnastics and it really kind of goes back to um, the, the titles, The Love of the Game, and, mm -hmm. and these are kids, and these are kids that are playing sports and they love it just because they love, they love the sport and right. they are going out there. And whether it's a, um, he did a painting with um, kids in the street and they're playing baseball and this is a time that he remembered where um, he, you know, you'd, you'd be up at bat and like, you know, the red car would be first base <laughs> and the black yeah. car would be second base. And so he recreates that in his painting. Um, there was another work where he has a gymnast mm. and she's actually, if you look really close, Closely, she's actually doing kind of a somersault and it's on the curb of a street. So it's kind of, you know, kind of old school meets new school mm -hmm. and a contemporary twist to it. And so, and then he does these wonderful backgrounds with flowers and different symbols and they just they just create kind of this magical wow. world that that we kind of remember when we were young and sometimes now, you know, when we look at professional sports we see um, kind of maybe a little jaded view or you know there's money involved and everything and, and this kind of takes you back um, to when it just was play exactly fun. exactly fun and and you loved it just because it was fun and and you didn't have any of those other um you know circumstances salaries uh, exactly <laughs> exactly so so it's 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 really a it's a great tribute i think to to sports and um looking at you know when, when we were a lot young so the exhibition is up until uh, June 26 mm -hmm. so um, we would love to have um, any and all people come and take a look at this the, this great exhibition as well as all the wonderful exhibition um, exhibits at the Virginia Sports Hall of Fame. So what are some of the other things that you have here? Uh, well, right. We have some great we always have some wonderful exhibits going on um, upstairs um, we have a wonderful uh, display of stars of the Commonwealth um, while we're known really for celebrating athletes and their contributions with uh, inductees, mm -hmm. these stars are still playing. So you have individuals like David Wright and Denny Hamlin, who's a NASCAR driver, and we have um, borrowed uh, you know artifacts mm -hmm. from their career while they're still you know they're still, still active. active they're still active so it's a great way to introduce um, youngsters and even you know just the general public to you know people that are still involved in the sports and um, so it's a great tribute to them obviously we have wonderful cases on 
um, our inductees that have made you know fabulous contributions to the the really the Commonwealth of Virginia with their athletic achievements and then um, one of the, my favorites is we have a, an exhibit that's dedicated just to Olympics mm -hmm. and so you can actually we have a touch screen um, monitor and you can go through and you can look at you know all the different athletes that have participated in the Olympics and um, there's all sorts of a uh, number of sports uh, that they've participated in um, and then up on the big screen we have a, a panel where you can see um, as far as all the athletes have actually won gold, silver, or bronze mm -hmm. medals, which is wonderful. Um, Bruce Rader actually uh, ran part of the Olympic relay oh. when it was in Atlanta, so he gave us the torch <laughs> and from that run, so that's on display as well. And then, um, and then we actually have um, one of our inductees uh, actually won, um, he had won several medals, and he actually um, is letting us borrow one of his gold wow. medals, Jeff Rouse, mm -hmm. um, uh, for swimming, and so we have one of those uh, gold medals on display, which is rather, which is rather special to sure. to us. So, um, of course, we have all of our wonderful cases with our Hall of um, Honor inductees. Every year, we change them, so it's a great way to see um, see our new class of inductees, and as well as you know, see our other athletes. So. Great. So, so, how many days a week are you open? Well, we are open. Um, six days a week. Mm -hmm. um, Tuesday through Friday, we're open from uh, 10 to 2. Um, Saturday and Sunday, we're open uh, longer on the weekends, so okay. it's, it's a great time to come and visit um, all, the thing, all the things. We have wonderful school groups that come in during the week, mm -hmm. as well as in the summertime, we have camp groups that come in, so um, I highly encourage if, in, you know, if you have a large group and you want to come, it's a great place to, to come and hang out. We have wonderful interactive exhibits. Um, upstairs, we have our NASCAR room where people can um, you know, test their skills against um, other individuals and uh, do a NASCAR racing simulator, Correct. pick their different tracks, pick their favorite race car. It's wonderful. Um, we also have a sports complex where you can, um, you can throw the ball and you can look at the speed of how uh, fast you threw it. Um, we have a soccer kick and football. We even have like a little mini basketball court <laughs> yeah. where you can test your skills. Um, we even have, for our younger visitors, we have some that are a little bit shorter, smaller balls. So it's a wonderful um, venue. Um, it's great for the whole family. Oh, that's so, great. Yeah. Well, thanks for telling us about it and oh. good luck with everything with the exhibit. Well, thank you so much. Oh, thank you. <laughs> the Portsmouth Arden Cultural Center is housed in the historic 1847 Courthouse at the intersection of High Street and Court Street in Old Town. Recently, I spoke with Stephen Grinnett, who told me about the center's upcoming May and June events. Well, Stephen, thanks for joining us today. Well, thank you, Rob. I really appreciate you talking to us and letting us share all the fantastic things that the Portsmouth Art and Cultural Center has to offer. Every first weekend of the month, March through October, mm -hmm. we have a first Friday of the month uh, evening event and a following first Saturday, and both of them are free events. So we have um, one coming up in May and then another in June. Mm -hmm. So on May 6th from 5 to 8 p.m. we waive admission to the exhibits and we oftentimes have a special musical series that's sponsored by the Portsmouth Partnership and mm -hmm. Town Bank and Ports Events. And the one in May is going to feature a big band, relatively new band to the area called Soul Intent. So I'm really looking forward to hearing this band. It should That's be a fantastic. That's right out here in the courtyard, right? Yeah, if it's nice out, it'll be out here in the courtyard. Um, like today, it's a beautiful day. If not, we have um, a building next door. You just walk through our gift shop and we can have the event in there if it rains. And then the next day, we're open free from 10 o'clock to five o'clock on Saturday. And I'm telling you what, Rob, in May, it's gonna be huge because it's a Mother's Day weekend. Mm -hmm. And do you know what Mother's Day weekend is around here? The Gosport Art Show. The Gosport Art Show. <laughs> so all along High Street, you're gonna have art vendors selling their work, original works by artists. And every time we do that, we have artists here in the courtyard mm -hmm. to demonstrate their arts and crafts. We'll have a blacksmith guild. We'll have Sharon Hilgers who makes socks. 
We'll have the... Uh, she makes socks? She makes socks, but we'll also have a spinning and weaving guild. Okay. And a lot of these artis artisans will have works for sale. Mm -hmm. um, we'll have a glass, uh, hot glass work that you can watch. We'll have um, ceramic pottery and quilting from the 5440 African American Quilters Guild. Correct. So these are all things that you can come in the courtyard and see for free. And that Saturday is the first Saturday of the month, so the museum will also be open free inside. Great. Now the Gosport demonstrations will be happening both Saturday and Sunday, but the museum will only be open free to the general public on Saturday. Mm. However, if you're a mom <laughs> and come in with your kids, you will get in free on Sunday because it's Mother's Day. Oh, great. So that's, a way, uh, that's our way of happy wishing Mother's Day. <laughs> everyone a happy Mother's Day, and it should be a fantastic weekend. Now, what is, what is the exhibit in the museum at this time? The museum exhibits we have right now will continue for that first weekend in mm -hmm. May. And it's Vanishing Beauty, which features artwork by um, artists who focus on environmental change or preserving um, nature. Mm -hmm. Now in June, the first weekend in June, that Friday will be the opening exhibit to, will be the opening reception to a new exhibit mm -hmm. called Portrait as Narrative, and it'll feature a lot of local artists who um, create their own self-portraits or other portraits um, of people throughout the area, and but still, again, a lot of variety, yeah. a, a different approach that each artist has to their particular materials that they're using. Mm -hmm. But it should be a fantastic show, and the band for that first Friday in June, it's June 3rd, and it's gonna be, again, from five to eight, free event, and it will, it's not gonna be a band, it's gonna be um, a long time local uh, musician standby, Lewis McGee, mm -hmm. and he'll be here playing guitar and singing and we have him annually. He's yeah. always a big draw. You know, the, the courtyard concerts on first Friday nights yes. are just, they're great. They really they are, are really a lot of fun. Before the first full weekend in May, the first Sunday falls on May 1st. Mm -hmm. And the first Sunday is always our Atlantic Co Coast Kite Festival in, Vir in uh, Virginia Beach on Saturday. And then on Sunday is the kite festival that we have here at Portsmouth City Park. And that is something. And that is loads of fun. It's yeah. from 10 to 4. It's a free event mm. at Portsmouth City Park. You show up, you can bring your kite. If you have a kite, you can make a kite there. Mm. Archie Stewart um, for a nominal, nominal fee mm. of about uh, 3 or $5. You can, he will guide you and instruct you in making a kite. You can buy a kite. There'll be kite vendors selling all sorts of kites. There'll be professional kite flyers that will guide you in flying a kite and teach you about kite safety. Mm -hmm. They will also do um, acrobats and kite dancing to music with big, beautiful kites. And they are big. Some of them are Some of them, huge. if the winds are strong enough, they can fly 80 foot to 100 foot long kites wow. that you can see for miles. Um, and uh, it's just a great event and so of course, people can always call us if they have any questions about those events. Our number is 393-8543. And you can always go on to our Facebook page or our website at www.portsmouthartcenter.com. There is a lot of things we're doing to gear up for that kite festival, and one of them is to offer kite making activities. Mm -hmm. um, we're selling kite kits for three to five dollars, and I've got a kite I, I made. Rob. Okay. Can I show it? Sure, to you? Can yes. I show yeah, you my kite? They, okay. Sure. <laughs> Okay, well, there's so they're kite. real easy. So here's my kite, and this is a Delta kite. And they're most of the time already put together for our visitors. And so it's really a matter of just coloring them with markers. And they are, oh, sorry, Rob, I didn't mean to dive bomb you there. That's all right. They are loads of fun to decorate, so you can make one of these and bring it to the kite festival. But if you'd really like to make a nice kite, you should come to the kite festival because the ones they'll be making there are truly quality kites that right. you can um, fly much better than this one here. Well, great. All right, well, thanks for joining us and telling us all about that. Yeah, I would like to mention just a couple sure. other things that we're going to have going on every Saturday. There's a farmer's market mm -hmm. that we're going to be starting in May, and um, we have it every year. 
and it's around the courtyard and we're gonna start offering tastings from some of the vendors in this market here in the courtyard. Mm -hmm. I, I believe maybe about every third Saturday we'll have tastings. There's another event in May, middle of May, um, on the 21st and 22nd. It's a weekend and it's going to be um, included with admission. It's a bonsai display and sumie and pottery display. So it's sort of the arts of Japan. And that mm -hmm. will be held next door in the building that houses our gift shop. Great. And Randy McKinney at Orzo studio he teaches pottery classes at orzo studio along with stephen martyr mm -hmm. and he's organized this incredible display of bonsai trees and sumie demonstrations that we'll have then it's on um, saturday and sunday may 21st and 22nd and again if they want more information just give you a call or visit give the me website. a call i'd be happy to talk with you <laughs> folks absolutely <laughs> right. well thanks for joining us stephen telling us all about that thank you for letting me blab rob thank you for blabbing so come back again <laughs> okay even though the Portsmouth Shipyard's main facility is currently closed for renovations, the museum continues to sponsor historical lectures at the Churchill Branch Library. In April, Carnegie Hall's Director of Archives, Gino Francisconi, visited the city to present a lecture on early 20th century world-famous opera diva, who was a native of Portsmouth. I understand that yesterday you gave a great lecture, sponsored by the museums, out at the Churchill Library on someone who I had, I knew nothing about her. Tell us about her. Well, her name is Sissy Retta Jones, and I only learned of her because she was one of the first African Americans to play at Carnegie Hall. And I thought, I need to know more about her. And what was odd was how much was not known about her. Now, here was a woman who um, was known as the Black Patti of her day. Adelina Patti was a great singer, great soprano of the day. Mm. And and what time period is this? Oh, we're talking about the 1880s, 1870s, 1880s, 1890s, mm -hmm. uh, early uh, 1900s. And um, she was simply known as Patti. You know, you see it in programs. So Cicioretta Jones at one point was known simply as the Black Patti, which is really interesting. Um, considering what African Americans were called back then, even in programs, the idea of using the word black to me, sounds almost like an elevation, mm -hmm. you know? So, she performs uh, at the White House. She performs in Europe and in Australia and all over the United States and um, at Carnegie Hall as mm -hmm. well. And she's given all these medals. There's a wonderful photo of her, I hope you can find it, where she, uh, when she would travel in, in the South, in, in um, the Caribbean, mm -hmm she would be given these medallions with diamonds and rubies and the same. And she would wear them at her performances like a brigadier general, <laughs> you know, with all the fruit salad, you know. And she must have sparkled when she came out on stage. And then her mother became ill. And she, her mother was in Providence. Mm -hmm. And uh, one by one, she had to sell her homes. She had two or three. And she died forgotten and impoverished. Oh, my gosh. This is... Unbelievable. So, when did she die? Was this like 1930? 1933. And she was from Portsmouth. She was born here okay. and then moved to Providence, Rhode Island mm -hmm. with her family and was one of the first uh, African Americans to uh, be, um, to, to um, uh, go to school at the, at the Conservatory of Music, mm -hmm. at the New England Conservatory of Music. And she did so many things that paved the way for other African Americans. What, what I'm amazed by listening to you is this was just 20, 30 years after the Civil War ended. Yeah. yeah. At a time where when blacks and entertainment were still doing minstrel, minstrel shows. shows and things like that that were very yeah. degrading. Yeah. In fact, at one point, because of racial barriers, in fact, it wouldn't be until Marian Anderson in 1955 mm -hmm. to sing at the Metropolitan Opera to be the first African American allowed to sing in an opera house. So, did that stop Cicieretta Jones? No, she started her own opera company <laughs> and toured the country. And then uh, that took care of one segment of the population. And then she started another, like a high end minstrel show to take care of the other. And so, <laughs> at the peak of her career, 
she was making anywhere from a thousand to two thousand dollars a week. And this is probably like when eighteen nineties. Yeah, where the average income I think was about a thousand a year for most people. <laughs> the guys who built Carnegie Hall in eighteen ninety and ninety one were making a dollar a day. Yeah. So think about that. That's <laughs> sort of like the equivalent of twenty five thousand dollars a week. Wow. And then to die impoverished and forgotten is amazing. So part of my trip down here was to uh, talk about Carnegie Hall and the history of Carnegie Hall, but it was also to get people excited about Sister Rita Jones <laughs> and to say, she was born here, take pride in this, yeah. you know? Now you were telling me before the cameras are rolling that you're, this afternoon you were actually going to visit some of her relatives who yeah, are still she here? She has a, a, a great niece who lives in Hampton mm -hmm. And uh, she's 84 years old. She taught at Hampton Institute wow. and wrote the only book. No, there are actually two books written about Sissy Retta Jones, but because her archival material has just disappeared, the books are, are uh, thin, mm -hmm. you know? And I asked if she would meet with me. I called her 30 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> and she remembered the phone call, oh and she said, absolutely, <laughs> and so we're going to meet today at 2 o'clock. I'm really, I'm just thrilled to death. Oh, that's great. It's a great honor for me. I, I, yes. I'm going to be that close, do you know what I mean, yeah. to someone who performed at Carnegie Hall our first season. Well, listen, thank you so much, not only for coming in for this interview, but for traveling down here and, and educating us. Well, on thank you for asking. Thank you. And uh, I, it's, it's been a pleasure. Throughout the summer, the Children's Museum of Virginia offers a wide variety of summer day camps for kids of all ages. Here's museum educator Corey Staten with more information on what's being planned for summer of 2016. I'm joined by Corey Staten, who's an educator with the Portsmouth City Museums. Thanks for joining us, Corey. Thanks for having me, Rob. Now, I understand there are a lot of things happening at the Children's Museum of Virginia this May and June. Yes, a lot of things going on in all four museums, actually, or all the museums, actually. The, in May, we're going to kick off the warm weather months with a special day for special needs, where the Children's Museum will do something it doesn't do normally on Sundays. Uh, it'll open from 9 to 11 for parents with children with special needs to attend, and then from 11 until one o'clock there'll be activities going on at the Portsmouth Art and Cultural Center and at the Portsmouth Naval at the Portsmouth Lightship Museum. So that's the special the day for special needs uh, on May 15th. Then on May the 20th we have the Junk Jam which is going to be a global <laughs> recycled music day with the Junk Man. The Junk Man will be doing a Google Hangout so you'll be webcast across the world with other junk jams that are going on to uh, show to encourage people to be eco-friendly with recycling. I just picked your people making music with junk. Basically, <laughs> anything that's not they glass like that. mm -hmm. or sharp or splintered, if it's something that can make a sound, you can hit it, bring it, and you can come and be part of the junk, junk, junk jam with the <laughs> junk man. And then it's kind of a, a literature tangle there. Um, <laughs> May 21st, Amusement Park Science uh, exhibit is going to open at the Children's Museum, which is just in time for the summer travel season. You know, people going to Bush Gardens and other places, they can come learn about the physics and science that goes into making all those amusement rides that cause you to scream and yell and get nauseated and all those other things. <laughs> And it uh, caused people like me to realize that 40 is not the age to ride roller coasters. <laughs> <laughs> and um, from then, June the 20th, all the way up through the, uh, August, the, the first week of August, we have several summer camps. I'll be uh, assisting with a music summer camp. This is going to be a percussion camp for uh, older children. Our summer camps range from ages 3 to 15. Uh, there'll be an art camp where for preschools where they explore under the sea and get inspiration for art from sea creatures. There'll be an ancient Japanese art history and art camp and then there'll be the science camp based on some of the things going on with the amusement park science uh, play well technologies will be there doing Legos and then we have the uh, history camps where people can the children can come out and learn if they have what it takes to be a colonial era British soldier <laughs> or to, if they can get ready and be ready to be a, in a minute to be a minute man for George Washington or to be a George Washington one of George Washington spies in colonial times so it's a lot going on at the different museums lots of summer camps exhibit openings and there's a lot of different special days that we're going to be having for our patrons. If people are interested in finding out more about the summer camps, can they just 
call here, go to the website? You can always go to the website. That gives you uh, up-to-date information. You can register, get registration there. You can also call at 393-5258, area code 757, 393-5258, and ask to speak to the summer camp coordinator, and they will walk you through all the summer camps, the availability, the pricing structures, the times, and then you can go ahead and register your child or children for the summer camp. It's a wide variety of types of camps. They're really for all ages of kids. Children's Museum, a lot of times people think, I, I think mistakenly assume it's little kids, right. but this is even into early teens and mid-teens, some right. of these camps We're are. We're going to have camps available for people as old as 15 years old, and the 15-year-olds don't have to worry, they're not going to be mixed in with the uh, three-year-olds, <laughs> so it'll be age-appropriate, and they'll be grouped off into their appropriate ages, so you'll have maybe 13, 14, 15-year-olds together, and then it'll be broken up into different age groups, so that everybody has something age-appropriate, and they're with an age-appropriate peer group. Well, thanks so much for t joining us today and telling us all about it. All right, thanks, Rob. Thank Stay you. off those roller coasters this summer. Oh, I will. <laughs> <laughs> the Children's Museum also offers an annual summer camp for teens focused on science and technology. Here's Dan Boric from the Museum's Planetarium to tell us what's in store this summer. Dan, thanks for joining us today. Thanks for having me. Good to have you here again. Now, you always do very interesting, really compelling summer programs here, summer camps. We've uh, covered them the last few years. Mm -hmm. What do you have coming up this year for 2016? Well, this year the sky's the limit. So we have a new program. It's a, it's a NASA-based uh, uh, bit of technology. Mm -hmm. And uh, when flying a kite is actually not flying a kite, we're going to be using it as a launch vehicle to uh, take some of our equipment up into uh, about 2,000 feet above greater tidewater area, wow. uh, some of Portsmouth, some of the beach, looking at beach erosion, and uh, use some of the specialized equipment that they have to uh, to study it. So what type of equipment would this be? Well, uh, first off... We have uh, some samples here. Yeah, we do. We have we have launch vehicles, and uh, they're very large kites, mm -hmm. very large delta kites. Uh, our smallest one is 7 foot, and our largest one is 12 foot. Wow. Uh, and you think about how much lift they can do, uh, good enough to lift one of these things. Uh, NASA calls this thing an, uh, an aeropod. Mm -hmm. And uh, you put the kite up a couple thousand feet or maybe 1,500 feet. And there's a little drop to this. And uh, we have uh, specially modified cameras down here, very much like a NASA satellite would have. Mm -hmm. um, multiple cameras in the bottom. Uh, Landsat, for example, has eight. The new version has eight cameras on board. Each one is responsible for a different wavelength of light. Uh, we have uh, two cameras. Uh, these are little Mobius cameras, uh, little digital cameras. Uh, one of them is, has been uh, modified to take ultraviolet, or mm -hmm. uh, excuse me, infrared, near-infrared light. This one takes near-infrared light, and this one takes um, a visible color. And when you put those things from up uh, at a great height and shoot down, you get two distinctly different kinds of pictures mm -hmm. that can be uh, manipulated like a Landsat image. Okay. And we can, we can do false color imaging very much like NASA does, and we give our students a chance to do that. Uh, it sounds fascinating. Uh, what age group is this geared towards? Uh, this is for rising uh, ninth graders through twelfth graders at Portland Public Schools. Um, okay. They are uh, gone through a recommendation process by their by their uh, homeroom teachers or science teachers. Mm -hmm. uh, many of them have been involved in the STEM program in Portsmouth for years and years and years. And this mm -hmm. is just uh, another step along the way. If someone is seeing this at the beginning of May, would they still have time to? They, I believe so. For sure, to absolutely. Look into it, so right. they would just acquire it through school about it. Right. We're looking at uh, uh, getting about twenty. Uh, high school students and to, uh, to learn a little bit about uh, remote sensing mm -hmm. and uh, you know, false color imaging and things like that. Really work into the STEM uh, program that we have already uh, set up in the city. Every year you do a fascinating you know, camp here. What has been the reaction in past years? It's been a, a, a good feedback from our, our, our parents of our students and mm -hmm. from our students, many of which have gone into STEM careers. Well, good luck with this. It sounds fascinating. We'll catch up with you later in the summer and maybe uh, do a feature on it. Very good. Thank you. Thank you. That's it for our May-June show. For information on events sponsored by Portsmouth Museums, log on to www.portsvaevents.com. I'm Rob Lauer. Be sure to join me again for the July-August episode of Museum Moments.